Let's take our Bibles this morning and let's turn to the book of Exodus, chapter number 33. I appreciate our musicians and I appreciate their flexibility when I change things. I had that song on my mind, you'll know why in a minute as we get into our scripture. And I knew they sang that one and they weren't on the schedule for this morning, but I made a couple of phone calls. My first question to them, how's your singing voice this morning? And uh, then I called Brother Bernie and asked how his singing voice was. He didn't want to answer me. And <laughs> I appreciate them being flexible. There in Exodus chapter 33, we'll look at verse number 11. We'll start reading there and we'll read down through verse number 17. Exodus chapter 33, verse 11. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp, but, the servant, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name. And thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I might find grace in thy sight, and consider this, uh, that this nation is thy people. And he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he, this is Moses speaking, said unto him, the Lord, If thy presence go not with me, carry us up not hence. I love that about Moses, he said, God, if you're not going with us on the journey, we're not going. Praise the Lord for the attitude of Moses. For therein, for wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight. And notice the second time God says it, and I know thee by name. Let's pray and we'll get right into the thought. Heavenly Father, as we come now to the preaching time, as we come to the scriptures, I ask that you would allow the Holy Spirit to speak first of all to me and then through me. Help, me, help us as we study. Pray you to help me as I speak. May I say that which you once said this morning. May we listen attentively to the scriptures and allow you to do the work in our hearts that you desire to do, and may we then respond to what you say. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Twice in this scripture we see the the reference that God says to Moses, I know thee by thy name. Uh, God is a personal God. Aren't you glad of that? He's not just some intelligence up in the sky somewhere. He's a personal Savior. He's a personal God. And God is interested in us individually. I'm glad we have a God like that. We're not a number to Him. He knows exactly who we are. In fact, it says He he even knows the number of the hair on our head. For some of us, He doesn't have to count as high. (laughs) Brother Hiles used to say, God only made a few perfect heads, the rest He covered with hair. For the Pope, Johnny Pope, who went bald in his 20s, said, uh, a bald head is like heaven. It's shiny and there's no parting there. (laughs) <laughs> but he knows who we are. I don't know about you, but I like it when people use my name. When they talk to me, they know who I am. I, I appreciate it when folks can address me by my, by my name. It means they took enough time to find out who I was. As I mentioned uh, in Sunday school, when I went to the, uh, the, the um, school board, the Roseville School Board, uh, clergy luncheon on Friday, and the the uh, the superintendent of schools uh, recognized me by name and asked me to to pray, and and, and I was just thrilled. He knew who I was. Amen. And uh, we like for people to call us by name. I know when they they train salesmen, they find out the name of the person you're talking to and use their name, uh, and, and they do that so they can get you to buy that car you really can't afford. <laughs> you know how it is in America. We buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. That's the American way. But we like when people know our names. There's something very special when someone calls you by name. I remember when I I was at a leadership conference um, 
Uh, it's been many years ago, before I came to the, the church here, uh, before I moved to Michigan. And uh, Dr. Treber was preaching that day, pastors at Great Church there in Northern California, up near, uh, uh, near San Francisco. And I'd met Brother Treber before, and, and, uh, but, you know, I hadn't spent a lot of time with him. And, and I w- he was talking to a couple of the pastors, and he turned and he said, let me introduce you to Pastor Brandenburg over here. I'm like, he knows who I am? That scared me for a minute. What does he know? And uh, <laughs> who's been talking? But we like it when someone knows our name. Isn't it an amazing thing that God says to Moses, I know thee by thy name. Not just, oh, I know there's a leader in Israel. No, I know who you are. It's interesting in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19, uh, Paul says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are His. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. God knows who we are. What a thought. As the song just says, He, he knows my name. And as I looked at this, I was thinking of, of, of just how many times in the Scriptures that God addresses people by name. And so the, the title of the message is not what you think it is. It's not He knows my name. The title is this, that He called me by name. There are times in the Scriptures where God speaks to people And he speaks to them by name. Let's go back to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 3. And we'll look at the first two people in the world. We'll just see where God starts with them. Amen. Genesis chapter 3. We'll look at verse number 1. This is one of those stories that we don't like to read, but it, it applies to every one of us, so we need to look at it. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw the tree was good for food, <clears throat> that it was pleasant to the eyes. A tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. The eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. We'll pause right there. This is what we call the fall of man. This is where man chose to violate the law of God. The word for that is sin. Romans 5.12 says, Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Adam chose to sin here in Genesis chapter 3. He'd been placed in that garden by God. God had looked at that garden, said there's not a man found to till the ground. So he made a man to go to work. Just thought I'd throw that one out to you. God wants us to work. He saw a job need to be done, so he made somebody to do it. Put Adam in the garden that he gave Adam a wife, said it's not good to be alone, and gave him a wife. And, and there they are in the garden, and they're, they're fellowship with God and serving God. And then he chooses to sin. Look at verse number 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam said unto his, Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Uh, I'm sorry, from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. So you get the idea of what's going on. They know they had sinned. They heard God in the garden, and so they hid themselves. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the, in the garden and was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And he said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this thou hast done? The woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field, and upon thy belly shalt thou go. And thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And boy, I'm glad verse 15 is in the Bible. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That's the first promise of the Messiah. Uh, 
Isn't it interesting here that God comes into the garden and He calls Adam. He says, it says in verse number uh, 8, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Now notice this, Adam was not looking for God. God was looking for Adam. I remember back in the 70s, there was a little lapel pin everybody was wearing. You know, I found it. Amen, I found God. But he's not an it. And you didn't find him. He found you. God came looking for Adam. And he called him at salvation. You know, before anybody gets saved, the Father must draw them. That's what the Bible says in Romans chapter, or I'm sorry, John chapter 6, verse 44. Jesus said, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. You see, God calls us at salvation. Remember that day when you felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit? I mean, you've been in church before maybe, or you'd heard the gospel before, and then that day it got personal. And I'll never forget that day on a Friday night in Pickwell, Ohio. The church that's now called Central Baptist Church. Dad was preaching a children's revival on Friday night. And I knew I needed to be saved. I'd been in church my whole life. The only place I'd ever been. I grew up in church. But it was that night. It went from just being religion and church to being a personal relationship between me and God. He called my name at salvation. Everyone that's saved here, that's what happened to you. It was personal. You don't get saved because mama was saved or daddy was saved. You get saved because you personally accept the Lord Jesus Christ. When God came here in the garden, He came looking and He spoke specifically to Adam and He spoke specifically to, uh, to, uh, to Eve. And I'll just throw this out. It's not part of the message right now, but He also spoke to Satan, gave him some things to think about. Amen. Uh, go to the New Testament, if you will. You've seen an Old Testament illustration. Let's go to the New Testament. Let's go to the book of Luke, chapter number 19. And there's tons of them we can look at. We'll just look at this one real quickly. Luke 19. We saw this scripture not long ago. Verse number 1. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was chief among the publicans. And he was rich, and he sought to see Jesus, who he was. And could not for the press, because he was of little stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. Picture of this is this tax collector, Zacchaeus, a short man, heard Jesus was coming. He wanted to see him. Well, you would too. He was out uh, feeding the multitudes and, ra- and healing the sick and raising the dead. You'd want to go see that too. And so he was curious, and I don't know how much faith he had at that point, but he was curious enough to want to go see this man Jesus. And he gets there and he realizes because of the crowd he's not going to be able to see, so he climbs up in a tree. Jesus walking by, look at verse number 5. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down. Received him joyfully. If you read through the rest of this chapter, you find that Zacchaeus got saved. He trusted Christ. But isn't it interesting, as Jesus walked by that tree, he looked up, and he called him by name, said, Zacchaeus, come down. He knew him by name, and he called him by name at salvation. Some believe that, uh, that, that it says here in verse number uh, 2, that he was the chief among the publicans. He was the head tax collector. Wouldn't you like it if the head of the IRS got saved? <laughs> then after they get saved, I'd like to have a meeting with them in my office. I got some stuff we need to talk about. Amen. Jesus called him by name. Uh, let's go to Acts chapter 9. Man, this is an awesome one. I love this one. Acts 9. Look at verse number 1. And Saul, this is Saul of Tarsus, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went into the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus of the, to the synagogues that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. You understand what's going on here? Saul, the persecutor of the church, he, he got permission. He went and asked for permission to go to Damascus and to arrest anybody that believed in Christ. Verse number 3, And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice say unto him, Saul, 
Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I'm sorry. And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the bricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Notice the difference in attitude. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city and shall be told thee what thou must do. This is the story of Saul's conversion. We know Saul becomes Paul the apostle. What happened on that road? Jesus called him. And notice he calls him twice. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? I uh, like what Brother Fisher says. Have you ever noticed in the scriptures, whenever God says somebody's name twice, they're fixing to get in trouble? <laughs> I mean, every time he does it, when he calls your name twice... Yes, sir. You better answer quick. Amen. And uh, he, he says, Saul, Saul, uh, uh, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? If you ever wonder who the Lord is, when the Bible says, Lord, here's who he's talking about. I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. He gets saved. Why? Because he, he, the Lord called his name at salvation. Salvation's personal. He calls your name at salvation. Aren't you glad it's that way? It's not just a blanket, well, I'm going to save everybody. There's some that believe that. Well, everybody's going to go to heaven. God wouldn't send anybody to hell. No, you choose to go to hell if you don't trust Christ. He gives you the choice. God's desire is for you to be with Him for eternity. That was the original intent. But sin separated us because we chose to sin just like Adam chooses to, chose to sin. But God made a way. He calls us that salvation. But that's not the only time God calls us by name. Let's go back to the book of Exodus. We've been looking at that a lot in our, in our study in Sunday school. We keep referring back to it. Go back to Exodus 3. We quoted from Exodus 34 this morning. Exodus 3. This is an amazing story. Look at verse 1. And Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came into the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not uh, hither, uh, draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to, to look. Upon God. You read following, this is the call of Moses to the ministry. You see, we see in, in, in our story as we looked in the scriptures that he calls me by name at salvation. It's personal. But when it comes time to serve God, that's personal too. He says, Moses, Moses, he said, I'm here. So take off your shoes, you're on holy ground, come here. Then God gives him the command and gives him the, the story. He said, I want you to go back and you're going to deliver my people. And this is the call of God. And God had a plan for Moses on Wednesday nights. We looked at that for many weeks of how God had planned and orchestrated the life of Moses so that he might be the servant of God to be the tool used to deliver the children of Israel out of bondage in Egypt and take them to the promised land. See, God has a plan for you. In the life of Moses, we learned that the plan of God, it was personal. It was not a cookie cutter. It wasn't like, it wasn't like everybody else. Aren't you glad God deals with us individually? Yes. He knows who we are. He knows what we are. He knows what we're capable of because He made us. Yes. He knows everything about us. You see, when God calls, He enables Moses at this point, doesn't, he didn't believe that he is capable of doing what God wanted him to do. And that's exactly where God wanted him. He wanted him where he knew he had to trust him. You see, you can't put God in a box. He doesn't work the same way with everybody. Oh, salvation's the same. But nobody's story of life is the same. And that ought to encourage you. Because if you looked at if God only used people that were like this or used people like that and you weren't like that, you wouldn't be used. 
But God can use anybody as long as they don't care if, who gets the credit. God's just willing for, or looking for willing vessels. Amen. And here we find that, that in the life of Moses, God called him for service. He's not the only one. You're there in Exodus. Go to Exodus chapter 31. I like this one. We're probably looking at this one in another message soon in Exodus 31 verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, uh, of the tribe of Judah. I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and knowledge. And we look at that like, man, he must going to be the preacher, the priest. But notice the rest. And in all manner of workmanship to devise cunning works to works in gold and silver and brass and cutting stones, to set them and the carving of the timber, to work in all manner of workmanship. And behold, I have given him uh, Aholeb, the son of uh, um, Ahishmach, uh, of the tribe of Dan, in the hearts of, of all that are wise-hearted have I put wisdom, that they may make all that I have commanded thee. Here's the context. When God chose Bezalel, it says He called by name Bezalel. Why? Because he was, he was, he, God said, I filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom and understanding and knowledge and all workmanship. You know what Bezalel was? He was the general contractor in charge of building the tabernacle. He did construction. He, was, he, he had wisdom and ability. He knew how to do stuff. And God gave him some other workmen. You see, when God enables us for a, a service, sometimes that service is a public service. Uh, I, I'm thrilled what I get to do. I get to explain the Bible. I get to preach. I wouldn't want to do anything else in the world. I love what I get to do. But I don't do it because I want to. It's because God called me to do that. But there's some in this room, you'll never stand before a group of people. In fact, it, your heart just has a heart attack if, if Pastor even asks you to give a testimony. Like, I am not getting in front of people. You don't believe it, but I was the quietest teenager in my youth group till I surrendered to preach. I'd sit back in the middle of the crowd, and I was real quiet. I know you have a hard time believing that, but when God called me to preach, Brother Shaw, something snapped. I haven't gotten over it, and I don't want to. Amen. But some of you, that's not how you're built. Some of you are bezaleels. He's given you the ability to do things that need to be done around the house of God. Amen. You say amen right there. I appreciate it last Monday. Some guys came in and we've been talking about phase one of our building project. And uh, part of that is to remove all the stuff behind the platform here that was in that area and, uh, that I'm kind of using as an office. And we had little wall, short walls in there that didn't come all the way out and cabinets and, and uh, closets. Well, that's all gone. The destruction team showed up last Monday and started ripping stuff apart. So I said Wednesday night, you know, Brother, brother uh, uh, Gene Luera was very carefully removing those blocks one at a time. And then Brother the bulldozer came in, Brother Ritz with a sledgehammer and just started busting stuff up. And we cleaned it out. And then we we're planning on, once we get the plans approved by the city, we'll be building walls up there and putting soundproofing in and drywall and, and carpeting and, and make that a nice office that's soundproof and good place for, for study and for counseling. Then we got our nurseries that we'll be building over in the educational building. You don't want me to be the one orchestrating building that. Oh, I'll oversee it because I'm pastor. But I'm not the guy that's drawing the plans. I thank God for an architect that's saved who knows what he's doing. Hallelujah. Why, it's like a Bezalel. You see, there's a place for everybody in God's service. Bezalel was called by name to do that. Go to Joshua chapter 1 in your Bibles, please. And we'll just, we'll, we'll look at a couple and then we'll move on. Joshua chapter 1, there's so many we can see in the scriptures here. Look at verse number 1. We saw that God knows Moses by name. He says, now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, into the land which I do give them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your feet have tread upon, that have I given unto you. 
as I said unto Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, and all the land of the Hittites, unto the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, uh, shall be your coast. And there shall not be any man able to, uh, be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide uh, for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper with us so ever thou goest. God says, all right, Moses is dead, but Joshua, I'm not dead, and we're still going forward. Just like he called Moses, now God calls Joshua. and said, okay, your ministry is a little bit different than Moses. Moses brought them out of Egypt, brought them to the promised land. You're going to take them in, and you're going to divide the land. And he had a different plan for Joshua. Aren't you glad God has a particular plan? For each of us. Go to Acts, uh, to, uh, Acts chapter 13. Uh, this will be the last one we look at this thought, uh, I think. There might be one more we look at. Acts 13, verse number 1. In chapter 12, we see Paul and Barnabas coming back from the trip they took at the request of the church at Antioch. They had sent them back to Judea with a love offering for the believers that were struggling there. And it says in verse 25 of chapter uh, number 12 that Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry. They took with them Mark, uh, John, whose surname was Mark. Now chapter 13, now there, there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manon, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. So God lists here, said at the church there's all these leaders. His teachers and prophets. Then he says in verse number 2, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And it is, isn't it interesting, in this chapter, God specifically comes to a local church and says, you got two men. He just listed in verse 1 a whole bunch of men that were leaders. He said, but those two I've chosen for a work. And God was sending them out on the first missionary journey. Several thoughts there. Number one, God didn't call everybody who was qualified. Verse one, there were a whole bunch of guys doing the same thing Barnabas and Saul were doing. So don't get upset when God chooses somebody else to do the job you wanted. Because God's the one that calls by name. You know, you, somebody gets elected to, to an office... You don't let somebody else come in and take the office just because they wanted the job. You got to be chosen for that. When it came for this missionary journey, God chose Barnabas and Saul. He said, I, uh, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And they did exactly that. They went out on the missionary journey. God had chosen them. God doesn't call everybody that's, that, that's qualified, and He doesn't call everybody to the same task. You know, we ought to just be glad God wants to use us. My ministry has never gone the way I planned it. I had it all figured out. I did. I started to preach when I was 14. I started making choices then, what college I was going to go to and all that kind of stuff. And I graduated from high school when I was 16. Two weeks later, I turned 18, uh, or 17, I mean. And then two weeks after that, I was in Bible college. Yeah, wait a minute. I'll do my math here in a minute. I went to public school. Give me a break. I studied new math. 16, two weeks later, I'm 17. Two weeks after that, I'm in college. I had it all figured out. I'll go to college for this number of years, and then I'll graduate, and I'll go do this, and I'll go do that, and I'm going to do it just like this. God said, great plan, just not mine. <laughs> Took my plan and shredded it, and then burned what came out of the shredder. I finished my degree in 11 years. I did high school in three. I figured, oh, the college will be easy. Yeah, 11 years. I squeezed it into 11 years. Not everybody can do that. You have to work really hard. Of course, during that time, I did get married. We had four kids, and we started two churches in that time. But anyway, uh, my plan didn't go the way I wanted it. And, I, and I'm not doing today what I thought I'd be doing when I went to Bible college. I had a different plan of ministry. We've got to understand God knows what's best for us. He knows how He made us. And let Him put us in the slot that we're made for. 
You know what success is? Success is finding the will of God for your life and doing it. Yes. There's nothing like it. So as Spurgeon said, if called to be a missionary, don't stoop to be a king. I wouldn't trade places with anybody. Some would come to me, Brother Brandon, we'll let you be president of the United States. It would get real interesting. <laughs> there would be different decisions being made. There would be nuclear waste spots around the world right now. <laughs> Boom! Just be glad I'm not president. That's not what God made me for. What is it God made you for? These men were called by name just as surely as God called you by name at salvation. He's got something for you to do in service for you specifically. We won't look at Romans 16, but Paul lists a whole bunch of people by name and how they helped him and what a blessing they were. It's an amazing list. You ought to read Romans 16 and just take the time to find out who those people are. I love what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. God's picky when He puts church members in the church where they're at. I'm going to make a statement that uh, you've not heard very many Baptist preachers make. I don't want everyone to be a member of Cross Point Baptist Church. I only want those people here that God wants here. And the choice isn't mine. It's His. Because it's not my church. It's not your church. It's His. He died for it. He paid for it with His own blood so He can do with it what He will. I'm just glad I get to be a part of it. He knows my name. He called my name at salvation. He calls our name at service. What is it He's spoken to you about? I just wonder how many of us are listening when He calls. And we didn't look at it, but we could have looked in 1 Samuel. And 1 Samuel chapter 3, God speaks to a little boy that's living at the house of God. His name was Samuel. Giving an answer to prayer. And God speaks to him in the middle of the night, Samuel, Samuel. And he didn't recognize the voice of God yet. So he goes to the prophet. He goes to Samuel, or goes to Eli the priest and said, I heard you call me. Here I am. He said, I didn't call you. Go back to bed, son. And he comes back again when he hears the voice again. And he comes to him and says, what do you want me to do? He says, I didn't call you. And after the third time, uh, Eli starts saying, well, somebody's talking to this boy. It must be the Lord. Isn't it amazing? The, the, the young lad heard God's voice the first time. It took three times for the old man who was away from God to understand what God was doing. Sometimes children are more attentive to the voice of God than we are. Other things aren't drowning out the voice of God. Finally, he says, well, what, next time you hear it, say, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. And sure enough, God speaks to him a fourth time. And he says, speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. And God told him some things that were pretty rough. said, Eli is going to get removed. And you're going to be the prophet. And then he had to go tell, Samuel what God, or tell Eli what God said. But he listened to the voice of God. Let's go to John chapter 20. I want you to see uh, another setting here. We'll look at two thoughts here in, in, in chapter 20. And then we'll go home sometime around 3. I'm kidding, I think. Act, uh, John chapter 20, look at verse number 1. And in the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, and unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. And she runneth, and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciples whom Jesus loved, and said unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher. We know not where they have laid Him. Of course, this is the morning of the resurrection. They don't know yet what's happened. They just know the stone's rolled away, and the body's gone. Go down to verse number 11. There's so much we could say in the next part, but for a second time, let's go to verse 11. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had laid. Now picture that here's a woman that had followed Christ. She loved Him. She served Him. She comes to the tomb. He's not there. The body's gone. She's weeping. She's broken hearted. She's in great sorrow. She looks in the tomb and sees two angels sitting there. That's not a normal occurrence. 
And they say unto her, verse 13, Woman, why weepest thou? And she saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned herself aback, turned herself back, and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Now picture this. She looks into the tomb. She's weeping. She doesn't understand what's going on. She had just seen him crucified three days before. The angels tell her, you know, ask her, why weepest thou? She said, I'm looking for Jesus. Where'd you put him? She turns to leave, and there's Jesus in the garden. She doesn't know who he is. Look at verse number 15. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him. And I will take him away. You hear the heartbreak and the sorrow in her voice. Would you just tell me where he's at? I'll, I'll take care of the body. Just tell me what you've done. There's a broken heart. And notice verse number 16. I love this. And Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. You see, she didn't recognize him until she, he called her by name. She's in great sorrow. She's weeping, saying, where's my master? He just says, Mary. She'd heard that before. She recognized the voice. She says, Rabboni, to mean master, teacher. And he said, then her, touch me not, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I, I, I have ascended to my Father and to your Father and to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and, they that, and that He had spoken unto her these things. The thought is this. He calls my name. It's salvation. He calls my name uh, for service. But He also calls us by name in times of sorrow. Isn't it interesting? He comes to this woman who's just weeping and brokenhearted and He called her by name. And all of a sudden, all of that heartache, all of the burden was lifted. Why? Because he knew her by name. I don't know what you're going through this morning. I don't know what heartache you're facing. I don't know what burden you're carrying. But your Savior knows that. And he wants to come to you individually. Notice it wasn't a voice from heaven this time. He met her in the garden. He met her where her need was. And gently spoke to her. What an amazing Savior we have. Can you picture that as she comes and she says, I can't take it anymore. I don't know where he's at. And at that moment, at her lowest, he speaks to her. Oh, we have a wonderful God that way. Those times that we're, we're overcome by what's going on, the song that we just heard. When we don't understand the heartache and the pain, but he knows my name. He knows exactly where we are and what we're going through. Here in John 20, there's one more thought I want you to see. Look at verse number 24. In verses 19 through 23, we see when Jesus appears to the disciples an evening of Sunday. There was a Sunday night church service, amen. And Jesus appears to them. Thomas was not there. He said, I don't believe that he, that he was really there. Thomas one of the twelve, verse, uh, verse tw uh, 24, called Didymus was not with them when Jesus came. And the other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, his disciples were within. Thomas with them. Then came Jesus. The doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. And he said unto Thomas, Reach hither thy finger. Behold my hands. And reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side. Be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. 
See, he, he knows my name. He speaks my name at salvation. He speaks it in time of service. He speaks it in times of sorrow. But He also speaks our name in seasons of doubt. Thomas didn't know that Jesus had been raised. Oh, he heard it, but he didn't believe it. We've seen the Lord. No, you didn't. No, he came on Sunday night. He was in the, we were in the upper room and he appeared. I'm not going to believe it till I see it for myself. Till I see the, the print of the nails in his hands. and See the place on the side where they hit him with the spear. I, until I see that, I won't believe. He doubted. We call him Doubting Thomas. Jesus appears that day and he says, Thomas. Oh man, Thomas responded, didn't he? I mean, he was doubting. Jesus said, well, here's my hands. That tells me, Jesus hears the stuff you say when you're doubting, you're mad at him. When you're griping. Why'd you do this? God hears that. David says that my complaint came before the Lord. You ever think about it? God hears it when you complain? Ouch. And sometimes we're, we don't think we're praying. We didn't intend to be that one as we're talking to God, but he hears it all anyway. He comes to Thomas and said, reach hither thy finger. And here's my side, put your hand there. And Thomas wanted no part of that now. Now he believed. Aren't you glad even times in your Christian life when your faith wavers, he still knows you and calls you by name. He says, child, come here. Let me show you who I am, what I can do. I don't know right now if you're facing something, you say, I don't know how this is going to work out. I just don't see how God can fix it. This is the God that said, let there be light, and there was light. This is the one who spoke worlds into existence. This is the one who came into a, a graveyard and said to Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. I believe the reason he used Lazarus' name for the souls because if he had just said come forth, they'd all got up. I love that song uh, called My Name is Lazarus. It's a story told about you know, the, the guy being carried to Jesus on the bed. Four guys carrying him, the Bible tells us. And the Bible doesn't tell us who they are, but in the song they tell a little story that as they're carrying this lame man, the first one says, I just don't believe he could do that. I mean, my hand was withered and Jesus came and, 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 and took care of that, but I don't think he can take care of this. And, and another guy said, well, I was blind, and, and, but now I can see. And, and, and the third one, I forget what he was, maybe he was uh, crippled, and now he could walk. And so there's not a need like that. And they turn to the fourth man. The fourth one says, my name is Lazarus. <laughs> what are you going to say after that? I was dead, and he called me out. I don't know what you're facing, but he does. And he knows you by name and is willing to address the issue by name. What an amazing God we have. Remember the day that he called you at salvation and you ran to him and he washed your sin away. So the songs have reminded us this morning, but when was the last time you came back to that Savior with what you're carrying today. Remember how he rolled away the weight of sin and he gave you peace that passes all understanding? That peace is still available because the same God that called you by name at salvation can call you now in times of service, in times of sorrow, in times of seasons of doubt because he knows you by name. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you that you do know who we are. We're not just a number. They tell us there are over six billion people in the world. But you know us all by name. You know who we are. You know our heartache. You know our burden. Thank you that you're a personal God. A personal Savior. I'm going to ask Heather and Cindy to come to the piano. During our invitation, I'm going to have them sing that song in just a moment. I wonder this morning, in what area is God calling your name? With heads bowed and eyes closed, nobody looking around, who would say, Pastor, I remember the day He called me for salvation. I know I'm going to heaven. Here's my hands of testimony. I know that I'm saved. Isn't that a wonderful thing to know? Thank you. You can put your hands down. Who would say this morning, Pastor, I don't know for sure that I'm saved, but I want to know that. 
I'd like to have that personal assurance of eternal life. Pastor, would you pray for me? Would you lift your hands? That's me. I'd like that this morning. I would say this morning, Pastor, there are some areas in my life, and I'm not going to go through all the different ways that he could be talking to you. But you say, Pastor, there are some areas in my life where honestly I need to know that God is speaking to me and I need to know what he has for me. Pastor, there's an air in my heart right now that I need to hear God's voice in. Pastor, pray for me. Would you lift your hands? And that's me this morning. Many, many hands. Thank you. I'm going to ask you to stand quietly with heads bowed and eyes closed. I'm going to pray. As soon as I finish praying, the ladies are going to sing. I'm going to encourage you to just come to an altar this morning and talk to God. Heavenly Father, I pray you'd help each of us now to talk to you about that thing you're talking to us about. You know every one of our needs. Thank you for being personal. Would you speak to us this morning? May we respond to you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. With heads bowed and eyes closed as the ladies sing, you come. Peace.